Okay. Hello, everyone, uh, and also welcome from my side to the second day of the Noon Workshop. Um, my talk is about uh, deep neural networks for NILM on low frequency data. I made a review and showing you uh, the results of, of, of this uh, review. Um, my name is Patrick Hoover. I work in the iHome Lab, which is part of the um, University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Lucerne, Switzerland. So uh, let me shortly show you the main topics we are working on. So the, the overarching topic is building intelligence. Then we have three uh, groups, smart energy management, active assisted living or ambient assisted living, and safe building intelligence. Uh, NILM work is mainly done in the first two groups, so smart energy management, where I'm working, and active assisted living. I mentioned that this is an applied university, so all our research is in collaboration with industrial partners, so we will not get funding unless we have an industrial partner. And so that means also for us, we're not actually developing our own approaches, so we are rather looking to the publications and look what's around, how we can adapt that for our needs or the needs of our industrial partners. And um, that's why I did this review and I thought, as I, I've done it anyway, so let's share it with you. Um, these are the, the works that have been done on low frequency, so maybe to mention with low frequency, in my case, I mean uh, data rates at one, hertz, um, one second up to about 10 seconds or one minute. So these are the works that have been published in this, in this um, domain. Uh, the first work was 2015, by, done by Kelly, and there was a second one from Mao. We had a few works throughout the first years, and then last year really somehow exploded. We have 15 works, and this year we already have 10 published works. Um, still, I got the years not finished, so I'm looking forward to see some more interesting publications. So in total, I reviewed these 35 publications. When I uh, started the review, somehow naively, I thought, okay, it's very well uh, specified. We have deep neural networks, we have NILM, we have low frequency, which really uh, tightens down the, uh, the focus. So I thought let, this should be easy to be comparable. It turned out it was very naive. We have a lot, degree, or a lot degrees of freedom, and I want to show you some of these. So of course we have different data sets. Um, the usual suspects, uh, Refit, Red, UK Dale, AMPDS, data port, then one work was also about industrial data sets and then some proprietary data sets were also used. Of course you can work on different appliances. The, the ones I show you here are the most, uh, the most used ones. Training data, I mean you have your data sets but what you can actually resample or do stuff on that. You can train on different buildings. Um, input features can be different. And then you have this noised and seen unseen scenarios. I want to lose a few words on that because I think it's, un it's important to understand what, what I mean or what, the, the, what is generally meant with these terms in literature. So denoised, that means the case where you have <clears throat> where your main meter that you're working with is actually not what you measure, but is uh, somehow virtual uh, sum of some sub-meters that, that you measured. And in the noise case, that is, that is the opposite. So you actually you're dis you do your disaggregation on the actual measured main meters. And of course, I mean, the term say it, in the noise case, you have much more noise because you have certain small appliances that you don't submeter, which will contribute or which will look like noise on the data. I will only consider in my review the noise case because the denoised case is somehow a bit an academic approach, but for real application, the noise case I think is, is the relevant one. Then you can evaluate your, your uh, approaches differently. There are three ways to do it or three ways that mentioned in the, in the publications, seen, unseen, and cross-domain transfer learning. So what is meant by these? So you see here in the case of seen, you have a training data set, you train on, on all houses, but you just keep some data away for, for your um, evaluation. So the house has been seen during training, but not actual data that you, you evaluate on. Then in the unseen case, 
you, you really keep some uh, households separate, you don't trade on these, these are just used for evaluation. And then at the third case, the cross-domain uh, the transfer learning approach um, case, there you train on one data set, and then the evaluation is done on a completely different data set. And this has been investigated by two publications so far. Murray, in last year, he gave also a presentation on this on the last uh, new workshop at Dean Jeko. I don't know how to pronounce that, hope that is correct. But this is a work from this year. And they worked on three data sets, Refit, Red, and UK Dale. And basically what they found consistently is that a transfer between the English data sets, that works quite well. But if you try to transfer between the UK data sets and the US data sets, it, it's a drop in, in, uh, in accuracy. And that's not that, or we can understand that, that in US we have dip, different appliances, we have maybe even different uh, electric, electrical installations, so it's not that surprising. It's also, I mean, in machine learning, generally, if we, you, you learn on a certain data distribution, your algorithm, and then you apply it to a, to a data set with a different distribution, then of course your accuracy will drop. So in, uh, I'll, I'll consider in my further slides the, the unseen case on noised data. So back to this slide with these degrees of freedom, you have also your different, actual different architectures. You can also train a bit different, but I want to concentrate on here on the architectures. Let's look what has been employed. So we have the basic differentiation between recurrent and feed forward. In the recurrent case, the most employed um, uh, network architectures are bidirectional LSTM, long short-term memory cells, or gated recurrent units. I let you read the other publications. Um, there have been two works with a bit more special um, recurrent setup, recurrent convolutional, and variational recurrent neural networks. In case of feedforward, we have mostly the autoencoders that have been applied. So this is denoising, stacked, or variational autoencoders. That means that you have an architecture where you have an input sequence, then you have a bottleneck layer where you actually try to compress the information and then you have an output layer, an uh, output sequence with the same length as the input sequence. Um, the next, so that sounds very similar to sequence to sequence, the next type of architecture, but here in these approaches or what is meant by these approaches that um, they don't have the bottleneck layer. So there is a mapping directly from input to the output without any bottleneck in between. Then you have again sequence to sequence, but the input sequence is longer than the output sequence, so that is illustrated here on the, on the right side. And sequence to point, that the first one that did that was Tsang in 2016. Then deep neuron, a combination of deep neural network with hidden Markov models was proposed by Mauch, and even generative adversarial networks have been used by Bao in 2018. <laughs> And then the last degree of freedom is, of course, how you measure the performance of your for deep neural network. So here you have several metrics, um, and I guess you know you're familiar with the formulas. I'm going to look at on the uh, on the following slide. I'm going to look at first at the mean absolute error and the F1 score. So mean absolute error there, you of course measure the, disag at the, uh, the disaggregation of the power and. In case of the one F1 score, it's uh, about the uh, classification, whether uh, something is on, uh, an appliance is on or off. So again, we're in the noised unseen scenario. Now these are the results extracted from 11 publications that actually worked with the mean absolute error. I split it up along the, uh, so here you have the, in the y direction is the mean absolute error, so lower is better. Then you have the different appliances, dishwasher, fridge, kettle, microwave, and washing machine. And below, I split it up again into the different data sets. Um, Red, Refit, UK, Dale, and this is a proprietary one from uh, Brevit, I think. 
Um, I want to bring also your attention to these uh, horizontal bars. That's uh, a baseline approach proposed by Jiang. Um, he said, okay, mean absolute error. I mean, most of these appliances, they're in the most time, most of the time they're off. So if I have a predictor which just predicts zero all the time, that's the value you will get for the mean absolute error. So this puts everything a bit into perspective. I zoomed here in, so it's the same graph, just on the low up to 14 watt, watts. Um, then I wanted to bring your attention to this. I, I split up with the symbols between recurrent and fee forward approaches. And if you look at the lowest um, approaches here, you can see this mostly these are feed forward, so basic convolutional neural networks. And that, I mean, fits well with the um, state of the art in deep learning, where it was realized that convolutional networks can actually capture uh, long term dependencies, can be very well captured by convolutional networks. So, um, if you look at that, from my perspective, the best one over all the, all the appliances is this, uh, this Jiang, publication from Jiang. Then I think Xin, which is here, if you look at it over all the appliances, performs also quite well. I mean, you have, she's not in the top ranks uh, in most cases, but she, for all of them, she's still quite good. But let's first look at the F1 score. So again, it's the same graph, a bit, it's only seven, uh, seven publications that mention this, this metric. <coughs> and now here, one is better, so the, the one go at the higher level are the better, better results. And you see here, Murray, 2018, that's the, that's, I think, easily seen, that's the best performing model <coughs> in most cases. So let, let's look at D3 publications and see what kind of, of uh, advanced elements they implement or employ. So in case of Jiang, we have dilated, uh, dilated convolutions, which is basically a, a method where you can increase your receptive field with only a few layers with respect to standard convolution approaches. Then you have residual connections, which, which help to learn deeper networks. You have gating, um, which is somehow an attention mechanism where you learn the network to focus on certain uh, in important uh, information. And then by Murray and Shin, they also employ multitask learning. Basically what this means that you don't have just one objective, to, you don't only optimize in these cases for, for, en for, for the energy uh, disaggregation, but they also, they optimize both on energy disaggregation and on off classification. Okay, two minutes on, okay. So, um, yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. So, uh, next question, I, I was asking myself, do additional features uh, increase performance? Um, there are three works, and the answer for, for the seen case is quite clear. Yeah, it does improve. For the unseen case, we have two results, and I, based on these results, I cannot really give you a color recommendation because it's not really good enough, uh, not enough data, but I think the basic intuition still is there. I mean, you should get better results if you not only include active, but also reactive power. So I'll skip to some, okay, I'll just have one further noteworthy point. I mean, that's from Dean Jekko. He also looked at uh, appliance transfer learning. So what he observed is that for different appliances, he actually, the, the learned features by the network were similar. So if that, okay, I can just use a train on one appliance and then fix these, um, fix these, um, the learned parameters and then use the, the, the same layers for, for disaggregation of other appliances and then just adapt the, the classification or the, the classification part of the network and it actually worked extremely well. So let's skip these. Um, what are challenges I observed? I think there is no standard way to measure performance. We already heard that, that's nothing new. Um, we have different performance metrics. We have different employed data sets. And I mean, the, the, the comparison I showed you was actually not quite fair because some of these uh, networks, 
they have much more um, trainable parameters. So in that sense, um, you, I mean, it's, it's clear that if you have a network with much more uh, parameters, it should perform better. However, the best performing model was actually one with quite a few parameters. Um, just a possible partial solutions for these challenges. Why not? I mean, if you do want to publish something, why not just calculate the metrics for a whole bunch of different uh, metrics? So that's, that's just a f uh, very few additional wor uh, work. And please publish the number of, of training parameters of your models. Uh, that's for you quite easy to do. If I have to re-implement your model or just to calculate that, that's just arduous. It can be done, it's not a problem, but it would be easier if you pu publish that. Why not publish your code? That's a very precise specification of your model. Maybe you don't want to publish the complete setup of your experiment, but why not publish just the code, how you generated your model? And I think you can even uh, publish the trained model. Then a comparison would actually be very easy. With if you if I have a, a different setup, I want to perform. I want to make a comparison with your model. Why not just publish your trained model? What what kind of future research directions do I see? I mean, the obvious one is that you check uh, current state of the art in deep neural networks. You apply that. Uh, you adapt that for nil. You see what's what's com coming out. <clears throat> I mean, that's what we observe. I mean, that's what is done actually. I would be very interesting interested to see some investigation concerning sampling frequency. So how, if I lower my sampling frequency, how disaggregation uh, accuracy drops. And uh, going in a similar direction, I mean, uh, I would love to see some work where they, where the networks are optimized to embedded devices. I mean, that's my concern. I want to have application. I'll, I'll need some results for real applications. And we are also thinking about embedded devices. So that, of course, would be very relevant for us. And then a further challenge I see is that uh, measuring ground truth data is very arduous. So I think, uh, at least in, acad in an academic setting, will not have much more training data in future. However, deep neural networks, I mean, their main advantage is that they get better and better and better if you get more and more data. But I mean, with the current data sets, we can not really exploit that, that advantage. So maybe uh, a way to overcome that is multitask learning or then semi or semi-supervised approaches or even unsupervised approaches. One very interesting paper I found recently was this unsupervised data augmentation for consistency training. I think that can be quite straightforward to be adapted to NILM. So conclusions. Um, we see that the state of the art of the deep neural network is applied to NILM. Um, we, I think we can see some progress in, in uh, disaggregation accuracy. However, comparison is difficult. I think there are quite easy ways to improve on this a bit, at least. And for young PhD students, I think there are still uh, some very interesting research questions. So the content of the presentation should actually flow into a publication. Let's see how fast it goes. So if you, in case you're interested, just drop me a mail. Um, for your reference, I also put here all, the, all these publications. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention, hoping for very interesting questions.